Oh, Welcome to the regular Lighthouse Point City Commission meeting of February 12, 2019. Um, I'd like to call up uh, Danny Slavich from Cross United, Ch Cross United Church to lead us in the invocation. And after the invocation, I'd like to ask everybody to observe a moment of silence. As everybody knows, a year ago this week, a terrible tragedy befell our county, and uh, I think we'd like to honor and remember. So please pause after the invocation for the uh, Marjorie Stillman Douglas victims. Our Father in Heaven, thank you for bringing this body together this evening to deliberate, to discuss the business of the City of Lighthouse Point. They'll have opportunities before them for discussion and decisions. Pray you give them wisdom and courage and integrity in whatever they say and whatever they decide. Thank you for each person here and the time and their energy that they're giving to make this city an even better place. Thank you for those who serve in the civil service, police officers and firefighters and city employees and all they do to make this a great place to live and to work. Pray you'd use this evening's proceedings to make our great city an even better place to live and work, a place of prosperity, justice, and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody, for doing that. We're going to call the meeting to order and begin with the Pledge of the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Mayor Trost. Here. Mission President Joffe. Here. Mission Vice President Mocker. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Long. Here. Commissioner Van Buskirk. Here. City Attorney Cirillo. Here. City Administrator Levisky. Here. Finance Director DePaulo. Here. Fire Chief Gilmartin. Here. Library Director Keyes. Here. Police Chief Lakata. Public, work, Public Works Director Schramm. Here. Recreation Director Leasing. She's here. We're all accountable. Leo had her attention. All accountable, for, correct? Yes. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The first item on our agenda tonight is a presentation from Scott Thurman um, from FDOT uh, regarding the bike lane project update. So, Mr. Thurman, could you come forward and uh, tell us where things stand? Sure, absolutely. I don't really have a, a formal slideshow presentation, but I wanted to update everybody. Again, let me, my name is Scott Thurman. I'm with FDOT. I, we've been here before. I'm here to debrief and kind of give everybody an update of where we are. And before I mean to interrupt, a lot of people in the audience who are attending probably don't know anything about this project. So can you like just give like 30 seconds about what you're talking about? And Absolutely. Give us Absolutely. So uh, this project is from Sample Road to the county line, which is right at the bridge uh, of at, at, um, Hillsborough. And the project is a really a resurfacing for a bike lane project. We will be widening the median to uh, allow for us to include a five-foot bike lane along the corridor. The bike lane will be on the outside of the roadway, uh, but we will not be touching that outside curb and gutter at this point in time. Uh, so we will only be widening through the median to allow for the space needed to maintain the existing 11-foot lanes and also allow for a, a five-foot bike lane throughout the entire uh, corridor. Um, the project itself, um, it's had uh, a few negotiations with the city, actually good, good communication and, and feedback, and uh, we've included a lot of uh, suggestions. We've made a lot of uh, changes and included um, uh, relocation of any, not any, but uh, I believe there's 11 trees that we would have to be removed uh, from the existing median as of today. Uh, and of those 11 trees, seven of those trees will be able to be replanted as they are their typical palms that we can find another location in the existing medians uh, after they're, they're relocated. So the project um, is about to kick off, or actually will be let in uh, August of 2019. The construction, we're assuming, we don't have the formal construction time estimate yet, but it, it should be less than about a year because of the simplicity of the nature. There is going to be some drainage improvement projects, I'm sorry, and drainage improvement um, areas uh, where we're going to remove uh, some of the existing uh, drainage within the median um, for the actual uh, manholes so we can relocate the manhole tops outside of the actual uh, curb line as some of them are today. Um, and also there are a few other drainage structures where we've uh, seen some issues with and under the um, discussions that we've had with the city of some of the existing dips within the pipes we're looking to, uh, again, further investigate and find out what the underlying issues are, but 
rectify those so it'll be uh, smoothed out and taken care of. Um, and that's, uh, besides that, there's a, a, some minor, um, uh, a new traffic signal uh, actually going to be placed at, I'm oh, sorry, an existing traffic signal to be uh, replaced with mast arms at Eller Drive, uh, just north of Hillsborough Drive. Uh, so that's one of the bigger improvements that we have at one of the intersections. Uh, one of the last uh, communications that I had with the city was we were looking to uh, upgrade the um, pedestrian countdown timers. Uh, and for my misunderstanding with our maintenance team, that's pretty much been done from Sample Road all the way north to Hillsboro. Uh, so that, that scope of work has really kind of already been taken care of. But the real uh, improvement is going to be the long-term bike lanes and resurface of the roadway uh, for the remainder of the project. And just for those following at home, this, this, there's been a lot of negotiations between the city and FDOT. This is not a city that's just kind of thrust upon us. We've been trying to... Well, yeah, let me, a little bit about the background as well. This was an MPO uh, project, so it was only a planning, planning, Metropolitan exactly. Planning Organization. Yes, I'm sorry, I apologize. It's all right, all right. I just want to make sure, there's a lot of people here, I want to make sure they... <laughs> Absolutely. And it was in collaboration, and I think, again, this project had spawned before my PM role at DOT. So this was a project that I believe had some initial collaboration, but wasn't followed through in the initial stages all the way through. And that's when I kind of came in and... I wanted to make uh, notice and make everybody aware of the proposed improvements and the possible impacts of the corridor. And that's when we work together very closely and, and kind of partnered with the city as well to kind of see what we can do to meet a, a, an easy middle ground. And I know, uh, you know, anybody that, you know, loves the corridor, they understand what it is and the aesthetic nature. And we wanted to pri try and preserve that the best we possibly could. And the, therefore, the initial seven or six foot buffered bike lanes that we had idea for widening to the outside uh, would, would have had a severe impact to the aesthetic nature of the, the trees along the corridor. So in our um, uh, discussions and, and kind of collaborating together, we, we came up with something that we could both live with where the, the real purpose of the project was a mobility project for bikes and pedestrians. Um, so we, we partnered and really kind of put in a five foot bike lane. Um, it's Again, not, I think the, the maximum of the seven or eight or six, I'm sorry, six or seven that we were looking forward to, but it's that compromise to, to make sure we, we uh, uh, kept the aesthetic nature and reduce the amount of impacts to the trees along the corridor as well. So um, I, I think it was a great partnership, and I, I know the MPO is very happy with uh, also being able to provide that mobility along the corridor as well for, for roadway users to include bicyclists and other pedestrians as well. Mr. Mayor, Mr. I, I just like to say to the people here and the people that at home that you're talking about that this was a wonderful example of how government should work because the DOT had an idea that we didn't like and so we sat down and they worked with us and the MPO worked with us and we came up with this plan that everybody doesn't love but we all like and can live with and so you know I told you when you were here before we really appreciate the fact that you listened and that we came up with. Yes, you do. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I appreciate, again, everybody's input. And I, again, I know I, I'm one of those PMs, and I know DOT is a, an agency, but we, there is a face behind everybody in there, and we are always willing to work. Um, sometimes there are certain aspects that we're a little bit more stringent on, but um, I mean, this is one that we definitely wanted to, to collaborate and, and get the input and make sure we get proper feedback. And we really wanted the city, as well as the patrons and the residents, to be on board with this project. So I, I appreciate the hard work that you put in as well. Mayor, um, Scott, just a couple of things. We do appreciate everything uh, that FDOT and the MPO did to work with the city to reduce the impact on the trees, and getting it down to 11 is uh, outstanding. Um, just a couple of things. One, um, you had indicated the last time you were here that you would uh, come back to us with a set of plans. We haven't seen that yet. Um, I just think I got something the other day. But more importantly, um, you scheduled a public hearing on this. Yes. And the public hearing is unfortunately opposite our next commission meeting. I so none of us can attend that. And uh, I had understood we were going to work on a date for that meeting so that we could make sure uh, folks in both cities could attend without having uh, conflicts. So, Again, I have to apologize about that. We, I actually hired a third-party company to, to do our public information outreach and try and organize this. Unfortunately, we won't be able to move that meeting. The public hearing is really set for... The um, I call it an intersection, but the, the unsignalized intersection at 41st Street where we're looking to do a directional island in the middle to mm -hmm. only allow the left turns in but the right's out. Um, and that was really the reason for the public hearing. 
Um, and is that, uh, sorry, 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 is that at Vintage? Yes, 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 yes sir. Okay. All right. So, um, but what, what we what I've done in trying to accommodate is we I've, I've spoken with our PIO, I'm sorry, our public information officer, and we're, we're going to try and do to accommodate both cities is open this up at 3:30 to allow anybody from the city or the commission to, to attend. We'll do a, a separate presentation. I don't say a separate, but we'll do a, a double presentation so we can open it up at 3 o'clock or 3:30, do a presentation by 4 o'clock, allow uh, anybody to come and make public comment from both the cities. Uh, that, that obviously have other obligations later on. And this so, way, if somebody would like to make a, a comment that goes on the record, we, we will ensure that it's there. So we can get something up on our website for our residents. So you're, you're going to re-advertise this then, showing that... Unfortunately, we won't be able to re-advertise. That process is it, it's a long-winded process in the sense of getting that information out. I, might, I, I can talk to our staff and see if we can get another information flyer that we can just have, actually mail out. but. Um, Anything the city can do to try and post and give information to the residents would be greatly appreciated. But okay. uh, again, I will check with my staff and see what we can do to, to see about updating the time frame for those that might be able to make it prior to the commission meeting. Right, because the times that are set right now would be impossible for anyone sitting here right now to attend that. I agree. And we've already confirmed with the, the venue. We, we have the venue from 3 o'clock. We can even extend a little bit past the – there's really no end time. Mm -hmm. But again, we, we wouldn't expect anybody to come back at 9 Never say that with a, never say that with a public. Well, number one is never say that with a public. public so, but it's 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 a public hearing is one of those formal processes that um, we don't really respond to, and anybody can make a comment, and the comment goes on the, the, the Florida Register for that project. So, again, I encourage anybody that's interested um, to, to come and find out. We'll have a little bit more project details. We'll have uh, project layout plans. Um, you know, roll plots, and we'll be able to kind of show exactly the, the improvements throughout the corridor. Is so. that something you could give us in advance that we could get on our website? I should be able to provide the electronic documents for that, absolutely. Okay, if you could work with Mr. Wabisky and our city clerk, Mrs. O, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you. Anything else, Commissioner, Mr. Wabisky? Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Scott, um, you know, our water, we, we irrigate our mediums with our mm -hmm. water reuse uh, system. Yes. Now, how much work is FDOE? FDOT going to do to modify the system that caps our pipes, and how, are we going to incur costs to maintain that system, or are you going to do this part of the project? That's something we're still trying to find out who the actual owner is, because usually we do a lot of the maintenance, but we have maintenance agreements with the city, so I, I'm trying to minimize it as much as possible. What I've, I, and I, I think I've sent the plans to you already, uh, but I've also received the set of irrigation plans, and what I'm trying to do is superimpose those over our plans to see uh, basically, in the turn lanes where there's a traffic separator, those will no longer really, those irrigation um, sprinklers and, and pipes to some extent will no longer be needed within that area because it will all be concrete. So who's well. who's, who's going to cap the? We, our, our contract will cut the cap. We're also going to, we work, we're working on a, a plan note to make sure that we uh, will include all irrigation and modification and will include pipe and and material for them to, to make modifications to the changes to the median itself. Um, I just spoke with um, uh, the city of, I'm uh, sorry, Chuck, Mr. Sure. Sure. And um, he, we're going to go back and forth, but I, I'm not seeing a lot of um, conflicts that we, would, would be uh, of any issue to the city. My, my, my main concern was the four inch main line, and that seems from the plan that I have to be. Uh, in one of the lane lines where it won't really affect where we're going to be modifying our drainage structures. So I'm not saying that there would be really any any cost to the city. Um, I, I asked possibly for a utility work schedule to where if there is a conflict, we could have somebody from the city just come out and kind of ensure that you know they're, they're okay with our process and procedure more than anything else. But I don't really see any true conflicts besides just the irrigation, which we're going to be modifying itself anyways. Okay. So. Okay. Commissioner, is there anything else? I no, appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, back. Thank, you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is appro approval of the regular minutes of January 22nd, 2019. Commissioners, you've had an opportunity to review the minutes. I had an opportunity. Unless anybody has any questions, I'd offer a moment a motion to approve the minutes. Second. We have a motion and a second by Commissioner Long. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next item is our Treasurer's Report, Finance Director DePaulo. Good evening. General Fund has $2,869,250.78 in 
cleanup deposits thirty one thousand six hundred dollars and no cents. Garbage and trash fund one million six hundred twenty three thousand three hundred twenty seven dollars and forty two cents. Special purpose funds two million eight hundred fifty three thousand two hundred fifty seven dollars and fifty two cents. Stormwater utility fund four hundred seventy six thousand four hundred fourteen dollars and thirty five cents. Debt service fund one hundred forty seven thousand seven hundred twenty seven dollars and fifty three cents. Contingency five million four hundred eighty three thousand seven hundred forty eight dollars and no cents. General fund encumbrances three hundred ninety four thousand three hundred nineteen dollars and seventy cents. Total all funds thirteen million eight hundred seventy nine thousand six hundred forty five dollars and thirty cents. Questions for finance director DePaulo? I'm sure will Well, I, I see something that will be uh, bring a smile to Mr. Marshall's face. Um, I see we have selected the vendor of CSR Heavy Construction for installing the batting cage system at Danwood Park. <laughs> Be good. So hopefully they, he's got a smile on his face right now. Good. Save him a few minutes at the end of the meeting. Yeah. Commissioner, is there anything else? No, just because we were going over the budget, I had a question for Chuck on the sidewalks. Can we, um, let me finish with Chuck okay. and then we'll go to Chuck. Right. Um, so I saw paving, paving in Marina area, eleven thousand eighty-one dollars additional work. Actually, I guess that is for Chuck. Sorry. So yeah, let's bring Chuck up. Sure. Go All ahead. Right. Thank Whatever you. you want. Chuck. Can you address that, and then we'll turn it over to Commissioner Van Buskirk. What is what is that? I just I it's some that? additional paving that wasn't included with the reuse project. Okay, so is this touch-up like work? Or? No, it's the other half of 28th Avenue. Um, the pipe that road is uh, has split and it has a median, so the pipe only went down one side. So it, the asphalt on the other side is not in good shape, but it's not part of the project. Okay. So we worked out with the contractor. We're paying the same price as Pompano for the milling resurface, and we'll get the other side of the road done. Okay. But that's on us rather than Pompano. Yeah. Correct. Well, what was outside of their project? And the, the areas where they did both sides was this, was in their scope of work, I guess? Yes. Okay. Commissioner Van Busker. Uh, I had a question for Chuck about the sidewalks. I noticed, you know, it's getting to be that time where our, some of our trees are starting to sprout up again a little bit. and starting to move our sidewalks around. I saw that you knocked down a couple uh, lifts the other day, but it looks like there's a couple more out there. What do we have in plans for that? We have more. Uh, we inspect the sidewalks every six months. Um, we do what we can with our sidewalk grinder, but there's a certain point where that machine just, it, not because we need a bigger machine, but because you can't grind a sidewalk beyond two inches uh, or about really about an inch. So you need to replace the flags and um, we did an inspection in January and working through the spreadsheet on the square footage, but we've got 75 areas that need to be replaced. I saw some marked on my street. So yeah, is that the orange? That's the orange. Correct. That's what the orange marking is. Correct. So yeah, I mean, I just was wondering, considering the quantity, we're probably going to have to go out for bid. Wow. Yeah, it's a lot. Oh, so that's just our internal mark, so we know what we what Correct. We do. Okay. We've got a spreadsheet that corresponds to all those marks with the address and the size of the flags and everything else. We've got some square footage to do. Cool. Anything else, Commissioner? No. Thank you. Chuck, while you're up, uh, your, sorry, your favorite topic, dredging. I see it's before it's a start date pending contract with the City of Pompano. Do we know when it's going to be on their agenda? Yes, we do. Uh -huh. It's going to be on their next meeting agenda, so that would be the 26th. So, right. Okay, so they knock on wood and we, we anticipate, it. we gave them dates that we anticipate starting the project around March 15th. Oh, okay. And um, I guess I don't just tell you what we conveyed to, to um, Pompano. So we asked for a six-month period for the sublease to give us plenty of time to finish, and of course that period can be shrunken if we finish early. Oh. Or short, excuse me. All right. All right. Thank you, Chuck. Okay. All right. Next item on our agenda is public comment requests regarding agenda items. Um, there are several items on our agenda, including an item that I'm pretty sure most people are here to address. So if you would like to address any item on our agenda, come forward. State your name, address, and you'll be given three minutes to speak. Of course you are. I think Patty said no. Good evening, Commission. My name is uh, Jeffrey Anton, 2930 Northeast 39th Street. I moved my family uh, to Lighthouse Point approximately two years ago and uh, from Parkland. 
Um, we moved to Lighthouse Point primarily because we like to introduce the kids to boating. So uh, we recently purchased a boat and uh, recently found out that um, Lighthouse Point is one of the only cities in South Florida that doesn't allow for delivery of uh, Rec 90 fuel. So I'm here to voice my support for uh, Rec 90 fuel delivery to Lighthouse Point. Um, I'm not quite sure what the findings are at this point, but uh, just basically like to say that I know that we deliver propane to the uh, city. We also deliver uh, diesel fuel, and the diesel trucks that are being delivered uh, the fuel to the residents also have the Rec 90 on board. So I'm not sure what the concerns are, but I would like to voice my support for the Rec 90 fuel delivery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Public comment remains open. Good evening. My name is Scott Morris. I live at 2730 Northeast 29th Street, Lighthouse Point, Florida. I'm also here regarding the fuel delivery for Rec 90 fuel, i.e. not diesel, because I understand diesel is allowed. We are a boating community. We cater to the canals and boating. And I find that there is a big difference in price between Rec 90 at Wawa and what is the price of Rec 90 at our local gas fuel dock in a Lighthouse Point Marina. And it's somewhere in the neighborhood of a dollar to dollar twenty-five a gallon. It's that's quite it's quite extreme when you're putting maybe two, three, six, nine hundred gallons of fuel in a boat, and you're enjoying your neighborhood. And I and I so I didn't realize that we didn't allow it. And I and I think in my my mind, and I go, you're telling me that a barge, a fuel barge could bring fuel to my dock, to my home, and pump fuel into my boat, and I will pay less for that than if I were to actually go to a fuel dock. That doesn't make sense. Why would, that, just logistically, it doesn't make sense. If I hire a mechanic, if I hire anybody to come to my boat, I have to pay a premium. Why would I pay a premium to take my boat to a fuel dock and fuel there? So. Tonight's meeting or tonight's agenda about this particular item or issue is that this all boils down to money. I will take a five-gallon can to Wawa and risk blowing myself up, first of all, at the gas station, next of all, on my way home in my vehicle, next of all, from my vehicle to my boat and put it in my boat to save $5 and change. Now, obviously, my boat takes more than five gallons of fuel. But this doesn't make sense, especially if every other city south and north of us allow it. So that is my concern. I have a lot of neighbors that are speaking up the same thing. And I wonder, that is this more getting down to that? Is there officials here on a board or recommended city officials that say, well, we shouldn't do this because we, we own a gas dock or we're part of, a, we're part of owning a gas dock here? That is my concern, and I would really like to save some money on filling my boat and have it safer to fill my boat from a barge that would deliver fuel to my dock. Thank you. Thank you. You can come up and address, state your name and address. My name is Charlie. I live in Lighthouse Point. My question is, what is, is, that, is, that, is that necessary? Yes. 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 Is that a rule, an yeah, ordinance, yeah, or a law? We make everybody give their address. Rule? Yep. We make everybody give their address. Charlie, my address. I don't want to give you the address. You don't just have to require it. it you know, Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. Thing. You're the first person I have that has not had to yeah. give their address. Well, I understand it could be retaliation. Maybe I don't want my address on public record. Who knows? Fair enough. Um, I mean, you are coming up here. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, it was a facetious point, but yes, thank you. Um, the point of information, what is on the agenda? I'm, I'm ill-prepared tonight. What is on the agenda? We're, we're, gonna get a, we're gonna get a report from the city administration regarding gasoline deliveries, which was requested by the city commission two meetings ago. Um, and the commission can do what it wants with that, and it will be 
public comments and requests from the floor at the end of the meeting. So the official item on the agenda I will read from the agenda is report of city administration, follow up on dockside gasoline deliveries. Okay, so this this moment for public comment will after this agenda we'll have another opportunity to comment. There is a point at the end of the meeting where public comments and requests from the floor where members of the audience can come up and address anything they want. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. I'll reserve mine for then. Thank you. State your name and please give your address. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Jay Peck. I'm really thrilled to give you my address. Okay. 2040 Northeast 30. We know where you live. <laughs> Pardon me? We know, we know, we know where you live. know where I live. That's right, Jay. <laughs> uh, I'll make this short and sweet. I'm also in support of selling gas from the uh, roadside to our boats. Thank, Thank you. you. What do you say? He's in support of the roadside. <laughs> The comment remains open. Come on forward. Hi, my name is Steve Fishman. I'm a resident in Lighthouse Point since 1986. I live at 2691 Northeast 46th Street. I love the marina. I love Chris Steeper. I've been, we have two boats. We, do, we fish a lot of tournaments, um, do a lot of boating. With my kids, my family, I have three kids. Um, we just think it's unfair that other cities surrounding us have, uh, have the ability to have a fuel truck come and um, we usually buy, you know, pretty good, pretty good quantity of fuel at a, at a clip. And we just think that it's a little unfair that Lighthouse Point, um, for whatever reason, you know, that we can't do that. It forces some of the boaters in this area to go to other cities and they have a truck come at somebody's house to fuel up. And uh, we just think it's unfair, you know, for our city to be singled out that, that way. We do a lot of business with the marina. We love Lighthouse Point Marina. We have nothing against Lighthouse Point Marina at all. You know, we buy bait from them. We do everything. But we just think it's, a, it's unfair that we're, we, we don't know of any incidents that have ever happened in any of the other cities as well. Are you guys aware of anything? Are you aware of any incidents that have happened? There's been some spills or something like mm -hmm. that. This is not the town of Orlando. Yeah, it's no way to tell them that. That's it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, Chris Speaker, uh, 2720 Northeast 45th Street, Lighthouse Point. Uh, most people here know me as one of the owners of the Lighthouse Point Marina, but uh, also uh, a few gentlemen ago <coughs> had made mention, and I just want to be clear, that because I'm on the Marine Advisory Board for the City of Lighthouse Point, it's because of my expertise in what I do, that I'm able to give some advice um, with generally variances, docs, and things of that sort. My position with that would have no bearing in it. This discussion ever came up in front of the Marine Advisory Board, I would obviously need to recuse myself from that discussion. Um, reading some of the uh, things that we're actually here for another ordinance um, tonight anyways. But um, some people brought to light some things going by on the internet, next door, things of that sort, that um, somehow uh, the city is in my back pocket that we have uh, some great uh, uh, ability to sway you guys one way or the other. You guys are all, uh, Sandy, are very educated, very strong people. You guys are going to do what you are going to do. And the marina has no bearing upon your thing whatsoever, as far as I can tell. <laughs> mm -hmm. I go through permits. I do. We're highly regulated. And um, we go through, just like any other homeowner or business owner in the city. And there's nothing backdoor going on with anything. So, um, there's some people out there that said that, and I'll make sure it's clear out there that that does not happen. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Hello, my name is Joey Agardi. 
My home's at 4130 Northeast 31st Ave. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs> no I appreciate your time today. I won't, you know, beat a dead horse. Uh, you know, I, amongst, uh, you know, everyone is a boater. Um, we competitively fish. I have, a, I have a good fishing team. We support Lighthouse Point. Um, I grew up with Christian, went to high school with him, ate uh, from the Naughty Dog on Sunday. Um, you know, uh, I think, you know, when you look at this, it's really a disservice to the community and the voting community that we can't fuel, um, you know, to a point that it may even affect the home values. You know, when I'm looking at talking to friends and they're big voters and they're looking at Pompano and they're looking at Lighthouse Point and they often say, I'm going to stay in Pompano. Um, you know, does that affect the home values? I don't know. I haven't done the math, but I would, I would think so. Uh, you know, it is definitely a monopoly. Uh, you know, I wish that you guys would have get rid of all the car dealerships in town and let me just be the one. Um, you know, but that ain't happening. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, when you look at your research, um, and we've done a little bit, um, it, there, you know, there's been more incidents at marinas than there's ever been at somebody's home. Um, and I think that it's important, you know, to the community. Uh, we are a voting community. Uh, that's quite obvious. And I believe that, you know, for your consideration, I think that, uh, you know, we should be able to fuel up at, a, at our home. Uh, the cost is significantly different. Um, we currently get some fuel from Christian, but we also get fuel from a friend's house in Pompano. Um, we have a larger boat, and we use it quite a bit. Um, it would be, for someone like me, a difference of $6,000 a month. Currently, we're paying about $2 less than the marina. We fill up three times. We hold 1,000 gallons. Um, when you do the math, it's a substantial amount of money. I'm just one person. When you look at the bigger boats, the sport fish, and, and all those things, it's a significant capital investment. So I would you know, ask all of you to take into consideration, and I uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Good evening, and thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Mark Rupetsky. I live at 4241 Northeast 25th Avenue here in Lighthouse Point. A boater on the water. I fish on uh, Joey's team, and so I share some of those fuel bills, and so uh, I uh, would really appreciate uh, the, the discount. Uh, in the past, I've always heard it's been a, a safety issue and a safety factor, but uh, and I have not done exhaustive research, but in everything that I've looked at from the other surrounding cities, uh, it, this does not appear to be a, a tremendous safety uh, issue, and I would think that since we just uh, voted for uh, $16 million worth of improvements in a new firehouse and all and state-of-the-art uh, fire department, uh, that if we can't handle it, how are the other cities uh, handling it? And so I, I really think that I don't see enough weight on the side of there being a big safety risk for us to have the fuel trucks in the neighborhood for gasoline. We are able to handle it with uh, diesel and propane. I think it's a disservice to the, to the community to not allow us the choice uh, to be able to use whatever fuel service uh, we uh, deem appropriate for our own use. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Mark. Hello. My name is uh, Darren Garber, Boca Florida. Uh, I own a uh, fuel truck company out of Boca. I just wanted to let you guys know if you had any questions, I could answer them. And uh, I've been doing this for six years, and we've never had one incident uh, of any sort, uh, except maybe a couple drops in all my years of work. Just letting you guys know. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? Good evening. Uh, my name is Peter Hansen. I live at 3150 Northeast uh, 28th Avenue, uh, about 100 yards north of the fuel docks. Um, and I support the marina. Uh, I support the marina full heartedly. I, I buy bait uh, every week and a whole bunch of ice and uh, uh, eat at the Naughty Dog. And uh, my uh, savings to me on a once-a-month fill-up 
are about four hundred and fifty dollars, or approximately six thousand a year, which is one month of joy. <laughs> but uh, six thousand dollars a year, I can buy a lot of shoes for that. A lot of shoes. And uh, so, um, I would uh, just uh, throw my way for the vote pro, especially with the incident and accident level, which I've been reading about extensively, which shouldn't be a bunch of a concern with the statistics. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everett Marshall, 20, 2821. I had to remember where I live. 2821. I'm just thankful people do it now. Northeast 44th yeah. Street. <laughs> Um, I can I can tell you from experience that I and, and I'm and I'm not a voter. I'm just giving you some information. For 50 years, 35 to 50 years, I was in the trucking business in New Jersey. Worked with hazardous material. As you can see, I had no legs, and I was burned over 50 percent of my body doing something that I had done for 35 years with no incident and it only takes one time so be very careful with and I'm not you know it is what it is and what you're going to do but be careful that you know just because nothing has happened doesn't mean it won't happen and if we're going to do something where people can get gas at their homes be sure that the regulations you know and everybody is doing what they're supposed to be doing and, and I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, and I still exploded. So just be careful, because even though you do something for so many times, not necessarily that it's going to be the same result. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I don't even own a boat today. Um, I've been White House Point for 40, 45 years. I've had three boats. I sell a few fish hooks on most of these people in the room. The biggest complaint I see are for the kids to not be able to get boat, to fuel for their own boats to go fishing, whether it's a Boston whaler, a 26 footer, or whatever. So they get to go fishing once a week instead of twice a week. And I believe that the kids are getting more out of it than the adults. The adults can afford it. The kids cannot. I tell the stories. I <clears throat> actually a bad story a years ago. Bucker told me to go down the end of the street and get gas to put in a small boat. Come back to the doctors. It's in Boca Harbor. Probably in the late 60s, 70s. Kids on a Boston on a um, Honda 50. And as simple as it is, a rabbit ran out, ran between the spokes, put the bike and broke his neck. He died. And all we're trying to do is get gas. Kids don't need to be put in that position. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment remains open. Going once, going twice. We'll close public comment and request regarding agenda items. And the next item on our agenda is a report from city administration, as I said, regarding dockside gasoline deliveries. So I'm going to call up our fire chief. He's going to give us a report on the status of his investigation and um, figure out where we go from there. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sean Gilmartin. I'm the fire chief. Uh, this ordinance was put in place back in 1979, and the fire chief at that time thought it was necessary that, for the safety of the community, that this ordinance be put in place. This has been brought up, this topic's been brought up many times. Each fire chief's been brought in the exact same spot, and each time we come up with the same thing, that it's a, it's a public safety concern. <coughs> um, each day, when we come to work, that's our main concern is, of our, is public safety here. It's something that we've been, uh, been uh, guided to do, that we're, we're expected to do by the city manager, by the mayor, by, by you, and all the people in the community to make sure that the public is safe. Uh, there's uh, quite a few concerns that are there, and, when, and, and like I said, our, our duty each day when we come in is we try to be proactive. We try to stay ahead of it to see what it is, give you what we 
what we feel it is. This is an ordinance, a city ordinance that's been put in place. We have a unique city here where we are able to have some controls of what goes on in the city. It's, it's small enough to keep an eye on. We have, you know, uh, a good amount of code officers that ride around. We have a, uh, an inspection process for the people who deliver diesel fuel and stuff like that. We know the trucks. We know the names of the company. We know the truck numbers. We have all that stuff. We check out all their equipment. Every year they come in for an inspection. We do a complete inspection on their truck. So we've done all these things for, for like I said, since this thing has been started. Um, and, you know, we're in the same thing as, as, as Mr. Marshall was with the, um, you know, it, it only takes one event for something like this to happen that it causes it. Any other cities that they bring up and they, you know, that there is other cities, Fort Lauderdale or whatever, they, it's impossible that for them to control anything like that. We're, we're in a unique city where we've been put in a position where we, we are able to make our citizens a little bit safer. As you can see with, the, with what Chief Licata has done with the cameras for the city, we were able to do take steps to make everybody as safe as we can in the city. And that's the idea. And that's the oath that we took when we, when we took the job. And that's what we're trying to do and complete. Uh, basically, for us, it's basically like a hornet's nest. You know, we, nothing's happened. You know, and we believe we'd like to continue it that way. You know, we're saying why why put something else in the process here that could cause a problem? And that's that's one of the things that we're saying. You know, we have something in place here. We have something that's going good. I realize there's you know that some people have issues with this with you know that have needs that want to have the gas delivered, but you know we're looking at as a proactive community, you know, what do we want to do and what's the protection that we want to do. Um, having a new fire station, I, we've, uh, we've heard this, so this, this is coming there that, uh, you know, multiple people come to the fire station and talk to me about this and say they were told that we have a new fire station is going to make a difference. It, 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 having a new fire station is going to make a difference. And we can, we can, Why? well, the fire station has nothing to do with with being able to, you know, to fight the fires or do whatever, the, do whatever is there, and we do, we have boat fires. We usually have, you know, one or two big boat fires a year, and then we, you know, and so, you know, we have the experience to go in there, and we try to do whatever we can to to uh, to minimize the stuff there. But we are, a, you know, we are staffed at a, at with only six people, and. The amount of foam that it takes for something like this, we 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 basically have around 80 gallons of foam, and water water is pretty much ineffective on a gasoline fire. So we we have a problem, you know, probably 80 gallons of foam that we have. We have 30 on each each of our trucks and 20 and 20 gallons spare foam and our you know that we keep in the station. Uh, at the at the yacht club, we've uh, we've ask them to buy some additional foam that they keep down there at their at their boat docks for us. And the marina has their own fire uh, system down there, fire uh, extinguishing uh, system down there. Which the Yacht Club does not? The, the Yacht Club, it doesn't have a thing, it's just water. It doesn't have, it's, they don't have any fuel, they don't do fueling there. So there's not. But they fuel on the boats. They have fuel on the boats. Okay. They have fuel on the boats. Um, uh, let's see. You know, the things that come from this thing are explosions, you know, like a quarter cup of gasoline, like a quarter stick of, diamond, of dynamite, I mean. So it, it's, it's just one of these things that can happen. They think that they do at marinas and stuff that they don't do at their houses and stuff is that they fill, before you can put your boat away in a, in a, in a, in a dry storage in a marina, they have to fill the boat back up again. So they don't want any fumes. The fumes are what causes the, the explosions, and the, and the more space you have in the tank, the more chance you have for the, for the fumes to get out or cause a problem. So the boats are filled up here. You know, the boats behind the houses aren't filled back up. They, you know, that whether they keep them up, or, you know, that's, that's always an issue. Um, there's electric plugged into the boats. There's all kinds of things that can happen. And they have all these regulations for the marine industry as far as anything to do with the fuel, fuel lines, fuel filters, all that stuff. They're not, they can't be made out of plastic, all these things to keep from having these types of explosions to them. So, 
you know, we have a lot of issues here as far as, you know, safety for everybody, you know. Um, the problem with gasoline, and one of the problems with gasoline is the static electricity. When they, when they go to fill up the boats, they, there's static electricity that's caused when the gasoline's flowing through the hoses. And that's one of the, that's one of the main dangers that they have. It has to be grounded, and they and they and they do have companies that do it, and they have rules, and they do a, the Coast Guard sets rules for it and stuff. They have a good plan that's set there for it. But this is something that we're able to manage in our city, where other people aren't, and that's something that we have to decide. Um, being proactive like we are and, and stuff, we've already had discussions already and like when anything comes up in the city or something's gonna come up that's gonna affect the community, the, you know, we have our staff meetings and they're right on top of everything and they try to get it, you know, they try to get ahead of it. One of the things that's coming up now, that's starting, that's, that's gonna be an issue for us and for everybody is that they're gonna start filling automobiles, personal automobiles. They're going to start having trucks driving around filling personal automobiles, and that's going to be an issue because, you know, the next step from that will be somebody will have a boat on their trailer inside the house that will be filling that boat. So we have some issues that are coming up here that it just it's one thing, you know, it's like it, it's, it starts with one thing, and before you know it, it's gone a lot farther. So with those, that's issues that are coming up. It simply is an app on the phone. They press it in, and they, you come out the next morning, your car is filled with gas. So we're worried about traffic. We're worried about, we're already worried about tank, you know, construction people blocking roads. Now we have tankers in the, in the street blocking. The, it's, it's just one thing that we don't need. And, and that's an issue that we have to decide is whether or not, you know, that, you know, we want to, you know, kick the hornet's nest here. Do we want to open the thing up since we haven't had anything? You know, just, just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean it won't. But... You know, well, basically that's it, unless there's some other technical questions you'd like to ask. Commissioner Walker. Chief, one of the, the, the biggest issues that we're hearing is that Deerfield allows it, Pompano Beach allows it. What exactly distinguishes us differently from Deerfield or Pompano as to why they can do it and we shouldn't do it? Well, the main thing is that is that we have the ability to to try to manage it. They they have their, it's a, it's almost impossible for them to manage it. The manpower that would be involved in this thing would be would be you know the, 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 like Fort Lauderdale, Pompano, or whatever, all the size of the city to have code officials, you know, code enforcement people going all around, or the police, you know, involvement to go around and try to track all this stuff. It, 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 but that's it, a it, tough, that's a tough, I mean, listen, I put a lot of credence, I'm going to be perfectly candid, I put a lot of credence into what you say, and it, it weighs heavily on me. It really, really does, and that's why I struggle with this issue. But just because we can control it, it's almost like to me that it should be the opposite. They shouldn't do it because they can't control it, so they should just ban it. It, it just, that, that argument, I, I just got to, it just, it. I get your point about the increased danger and the increased risk associated, but that one, that's not, that doesn't carry the day with me for what it's worth for the commission. It just seems like it should be the opposite. Well, I, I would agree with that. What, what we're saying is we, we can control it. So therefore, if we were to allow it, we could make sure that any truck that came in here to fuel had to meet your specifications, Coast Guard specifications, or whatever. But you would be inspecting every truck. You would make sure that only those trucks that passed our local regulations would be allowed to fuel, and we could control it. I understand Fort Lauderdale population is very big, where fuel trucks, they don't even know who's coming in and delivering fuel. Well, we would know, and we could stop those that we felt did not meet our qualifications or our spec specifications, because we could control it. I think that would give us an advantage that we could control it rather than a disadvantage. Well, it's a, go, go ahead. It's, it's just a, it's a, it's the, the matter of controlling the thing is there is like we, we do it now where we have the inspections and stuff. And the gentleman lives in our city. We met the mayor, set up a meeting with us to, have to, to meet with him and talk to him. And he runs a top of the, the top of the line business, you know. He has, he, he, his trucks are always in, in, in great shape. Uh, he always has all his paperwork. He has all the stuff that's, that, that's required. 
And so we have those issues. It's, it's, it was from from what I've talked to to the firemen, the older firemen that have been here and stuff. And they, since when the ordinance was put in place, was that there was issues with they had people just coming in and and fueling up the stuff, and it was causing problems and causing problems with with fuel spills. And uh, you know that that was mostly the thing with the fuel spills and stuff like that that they were doing. And of course, technologies. You know, some of the technology has changed. But when we met, you know, met with the owner of the company there, basically. You know, there hasn't really been any changes. Gas is still gas. The static electricity is still there. Everything, all the, all the, all the issues are still present. You know, so that, that so there hasn't been any real change in anything. It's just a matter of whether or not you, you know, how much that you regulate it. We're like I said, we're just in a position where we can regulate this to find out it to you know what's what's going on and who's there. We don't have the gas delivered now. We haven't had a problem with it, so. As far as the public safety is, it's that's really the issue. We don't need to, you know, it's, it depends on if you know that we want to have it or, or not. But right now we don't have it. We don't have the the issue with it, and it's something that is not going to be cured by a new fire station or any stuff there. Not that our guys are ready to fight the fire. They're trained. They use the foam. We have all the rest of the stuff there. But you know, these are big boats and a lot of gas and and. Like I said, we do have things that are coming in the future that are gonna that's gonna be is gonna have definitely need to be thought about, and that's gonna be this delivery for automobiles, gas delivery to automobiles, and gas delivery for it'll be folks on trailers. It'll be the next thing there for us to try to control. Commissioner Johnson had a comment. Oh, I just uh, I, I I just had a, a point of confusion. I have a letter here from a resident, oh. and then two different residents spoke tonight, and. I, someone said it's 50 cents a gallon different. One person tonight said it's a dollar to a dollar 25 difference. Someone else said it's two dollars difference. I just was curious to know just exactly how much difference that that's three different. I mean, there's a, to me, there's a big difference between 50 cents a gallon and two dollars a gallon. Where, where would we get these figures from? You know, we'll get, we'll get, we're going we're to keep working. We're keep I, it's a rhetorical question. Wait, we can I guess for me that it's a confusing. We want to do that. Yeah, let's do it at the end. Um, fair point. Um, before I forget, so a resident, not to break the flow here, but a resident did uh, take the time to send us all an email um, that you'd all received. Uh, she wanted it included the record. Um, Madam Clerk, you have the email, correct? Yes. And we're clear that that email, it was a pro, it was an email in, in favor of um, allowing the delivery, um, I'll call it street delivery. Um, so I just want to make sure that's included in the record. So I had forgotten to do that during public comment. So sorry about that. Um, hey, Commissioners, anything else? Yes, Commissioner Long. Yeah, um, Chief, you know, my concern, and I know a lot of people spoke just solely on the cost. Um, you know, the cost convenience. And one of the things we've said here before is really safety, and you're bringing that up. Um, there's also environmental concerns, obviously, in a spill. And how would we be able to handle that if there was a spill in the water with gas? Well, they, they have different limits for, for how much gas is spilled. The problem is, is that, they, you know, like one gallon of gas, like poured in the water, can ruin like a million gallons of, of water. It's the thing there. So they, they, they have like they have limits, which I believe is 25 gallons. They, they have to report it to the Coast Guard. Um, and then how do we ensure report? How do we ensure reporting? Well, that's a lot of the that's a lot of the issue with the stuff. Like they, they, you know, where they're saying, well, there's are there any, any incidents? Well, the problem is, is there's no recording of the incidents. Who's because they're self I mean, self police. Is that what you're saying? Well, they they, have, they, they 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 do it. Though. I mean, the people that are above board, they do it. I mean, they they call it. They have a they have a spill. They call. It. I mean, the people who are trying to do the right thing. They have their businesses on the line, their licenses on the line. So, you know, they they want to do it. They and they do everything they can. They have shut off valves. They have small containment things and stuff, but we get them here all the time. I can I can attest for the mayor is involved in every fuel spill there is. I mean, we we're out. He get he starts, and when we're out there, wherever you know wherever it goes, so we get and it, the, the fuel spills last for a while before they get out of there, and everybody starts calling on them and thinking, and those are small ones. 
You know, we and we get them and thing there. We get them just like they. We had one. You know, we had one not too long ago out of the yacht club where they, they, uh, they, they, you know, put the fuel in the, in their in the. Uh, they put the water hose in their fuel tank and pumped out all the, all the fuel out. Not all of it, but I guess 25 gallons or whatever. We call the Coast Guard. They call the Coast Guard and to get it taken care of, you know. But, you know, we get these fills, you know, fairly fairly frequently, and it comes from the boat being submerged. We get them all just not from fueling, of course. So. Okay, well, that's not um, so we talk about the environmental concerns. What's the flammability point of gas on water? I mean, is there or is it? it it's the, the gas is flammable at, at all times. It floats, of course, it's lighter than water, so it floats. And, it, and, it, and, and water is not, that's why we have the foam for it. That's why we have the firefighting foam is to try to, to put out the fire. So it, 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 it actually has, it, it can be lit like at minus 45 degrees till whatever. So basically at all times, gas is given off fumes that can be ignited. That's the danger in it. Where, where diesel fuel, diesel fuel is over 100. It's over 100 degrees. So that's why you basically, you know, it out here in, during the day, it's not giving off any fumes for it. You know, even on the hottest day here, it's not doing that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, a lot difference in the flammability and the explosion thing of it. So, okay, and, it, and it's been talked about for dockside delivery with the boat coming up and delivering dockside, as well as then trucks coming into our neighborhoods. Um, what safety pieces do they have on those, or which is you know which has a more of a greater inherent risk than the other? If well, any. they do like the the barge the barge thing that they do. They they do it like. I was talking to somebody at at, um, at the uh, marina in Fort Lauderdale. They don't allow them to come up to where the boats are tied up. So they did. They 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 untie the boats, move them out. They fill them up with the fuel from the barge, and then push it back in again. Just to see, you know, it's all the marinas and stuff are all regulated or already done that, and the yacht club, of course, are all regulated. So they have rules about being filled up and doing that stuff where fuel can be delivered. So if they just have a bunch of boat slips. They are. There's a, they have an issue with what's safety and thing there. And we actually do the same thing with the Yacht Club. They're only allowed to have fuel delivered on certain days and all that stuff because they don't have, you know. And by fuel, you're referring to the diesel. Diesel fuel. Yeah. Okay. And the uh, roadside deliveries, I mean, how, how do their shutoffs work? Does the person say, oh, geez, I got a problem. I got to run all the way back to the truck or? Yes. They, they, they have they have all rules in place there. And I, we've talked to some, many people, and like I said, the mayor had set up a meeting, and we went all over all the procedures, and I've called the people and gone over the procedures. They've sent me the procedures of what they do. Uh, they, they, you know, don't deliver fuel at night. They, they make sure that the home, you know, it's supposed to be the homeowner is at the residence. But it's just it's one person comes, you know, with the truck and, and, and fills, the, fills the boat up. And um, the person that lives in our city, his company, he, you know, he says that he has a certain person trained to do it, and and uh, they use a, a separate truck. They don't. He does. They don't have a. He said he doesn't use a, a you know, a mixed truck with different fuels on it. That mm -hmm. is what he told us. So. Okay. But, um, um. And then they have to drag the hose. They have to. What, what, this is what they do. They have to drag the hose around. You know, from from the street. Drag it out to the drag it out to the boat to the side there. They have to set up a you know a ground. You know they you know the good part is that they know where the fuel goes. They don't make the mistakes like the homeowner is doing and put it in the wrong place and stuff like that. Rod holders and all that kind of stuff. So there is some there is some good part about being the experts about filling up the boat. There's there they do have some good things about it, um, but uh, you know they think that they that they're the static electricity coming from from. Uh, and I don't have it for a fact. There's electricity from these, from these um, new composite decks and stuff is even more than it is from the wood decks and things like that. But depending on the length of the hose, how much you have to drag out, it really most of them there should be in it in the, in the NFPA 30, which is has to do with the fueling and stuff. They reckon the hoses 
should be no more than 50 feet long. But there's no house here where you can make it to the backyard with the, to the boat within 50 feet. So, but these are, you know, it's just the, those are the concerns that they have in there. And so they do have an operator there. They have an automatic shutoff thing. They have all kinds of things to, you know, to make it safe. But it's backed by the truck. But it's backed by it's the truck. So that, their handle is just like a regular, you know, like a like you use that again. Yeah, if you have a leak click or, or some other problem. Right. But that's the good part that they, like I said, most part, they're putting them in the, they're putting it in where the gas belongs and not putting it in the fuel into the rod holder. So, but there could be a leak underneath the boat. It could be whatever. Anything, the hose could be leaking. Anything could happen. Right. Um, now I know that Lighthouse Point Yacht Club used to have fuel, um, and they chose. I think when I don't know were the new regulations as far as the fuel tanks and the money they had to put in for bring the safety. The new tanks. The new tanks. The new tanks. So, I mean, I know that the Sands, the uh, Lighthouse Point Marina, and the Cove, I mean, they have a lot of dollars invested into the safety aspect of it. Um, what do they have that these, be it uh, the, the boat or the um, roadside delivery, where would the problems occur there that they might not have the same safety precautions? Well, they have, they have, you know, like that the, at the marina, they have a fire suppression system set there. You know, it's already mm -hmm. at the dock. It's there right where, where the tanks are. They have the shutoffs. They have all the, you know, things that are there. What if they, up, when you say fire, but you got to, like, can you say, what is the fire suppression system? I think gas and something goes, like, is that what we're talking about? I, they have a big dry chem system down there. Okay. I'm not sure exactly what the poundage is off the top of my head. I'm sorry. But it's like a chemical. No, I'm not the chemi it's the a chemical that actually that they ejects have. and big explosion chemical comes they, and puts they on fire? Cover, it smothers it. Okay. It's, it has to smother the thing. That's what the problem is. It has to smother. That's why water doesn't work on it. And these trucks don't have that. These trucks don't. They have an extinguisher on them is what they have. They have, a, okay. they have an extinguisher. They have an extinguisher for the fuel. They have an extinguisher because of the truck. So they usually have two on there for DOT requirements. Okay. But like the extinguisher I have in my house? Well, a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And they have spill pads. They have, they have the stuff that they put in there that's, that's funny. And, and like I said, the, 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 the gentleman lives in our city, runs a top notch. He has all the stuff that's required through the Coast Guard and all the stuff. And that was even his recommendation was, you know, the Coast Guard requirements should be on all the stuff. And that's what we use basically for our diesel trucks to come in here. Okay. Um, how long would it take you if a fire broke out on the average to get the location set up and start working on it. For the to to for something for let's it, let's talk worst case. Let's talk worst case, because that's what I am concerned about. Let's talk a worst case, bad, bad Truck goes boom on a residential street. Or both of Or both yeah. Or both well, of Basically, it's yeah. part of this operation. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I, yeah. I mean, I, that's I, what I want to hear. Well, it's just, it's our travel time. So it'll take anywhere between, you know, like four to five minutes probably actually to get there. And then a couple of minutes to, to, to set up. And then, then, like I said, we would use our foam. We have 30 gallons of foam in a, in a tank on our truck. And, and uh, we would use that. And, but we, like I said, so we probably have 80 total for the whole thing. We've got, that wouldn't last us 2,400 gallons. And thing, and the, our hydrants, the water pressure in our city is so high, we, we probably would be, we probably run through that fuel in a matter of, you know, minutes. But we also have mutual aid with Pompano and Deerfield. Well, we don't have, we don't have mutual aid. We have mutual aid with them. We don't have automatic aid for them that. Right. We have mutual aid. But we have mutual aid with everybody in the county. So we, we could call the county. We can call everybody. We call in. We call in. We call in the Calvary. If we if yeah. it and there's a no, and we could say no, and they could say no. They could say no. Well, now, why well, would Pompano, we, Pompano, Pompano would come because you have because they're busy on their own thing. They have another issue in their own thing. I mean, their their closest unit might be at 441. And we there's, we we made arrangements to. Sorry, I would just say something. He, he brought up something. You're talking about mutual aid, automatic aid. The difference is in it. One of the things that everybody mentioned is, yeah, there is a lot of fuel people along the coast here. You got Deerfield, Pompano, Fort Lauderdale, 
Dania, Hollywood, those, all those things have one thing in common we do not. One thing that everybody missed. We are not a class one fire department. That means that we do not carry the manpower or the woman power, the, the capacity to put out fire in a timely manner for our insurance rates. We are a class three borderline on a class two. Class two. We are two. Class two. Class two. Thank you, Gene. We're still a class two department. The idea is that we do not have the capability that some of those other departments have when it comes. They're talking about three-person engines, three-person rescues, and I think that there is a difference there. It's one of the things that we that we do have to factor in because we have the opportunity, yes, to set up an operation, but according to NFPA standards, when it comes down to fighting a situation of that, we start to fall outside of the standard. And although it is a standard, not a law, NFPA does look along those case law and there is judicial consequences when you start to fall outside of NFPA standards. And that is fact throughout throughout the country right now. So I just would say that we, we make sure that we're, you know, we keep talking about the fire station, which I know is beautiful. hopefully will be a great opportunity for us to expand our crews so we could then increase our ability to fight fire. But ultimately, in the end, a fire station does not dictate what our apparatus what our water supply, what our time of travel is to and from any one situation. Matter of fact, we actually send two trucks on all of our EMS calls. So there's a good chance that there could only be one truck if we run one call, one not feeling well, one anything. So I just, I, I think that's important that we take a, we grasp at the whole situation here. Not that the, there's a very valid point with cost savings and I understand that, but again, I come back to what Mr. Marshall says. It only takes once, it only takes what is that risk reward benefit. And uh, I think that the class one fire department kind of gives you a little bit of a litmus test. Uh, like, okay, this is what these people offer, this is what we offer. It's nothing that we can't do, but that costs money. That costs significant money and investment and training and a lot of other things. I know Chief Martin comes from, uh, uh, Sean comes from a class one fire department, one of the first in the country, one of the first in the state in Pepper Pines. And that takes a lot of time and effort. There's one person that currently just goes ahead and dictates their whole job is to maintain a class one fire department. So I bring that up because when we're just talking about mutual aid and automatic aid, I think that's an important aspect to look into. I'd like to say something before sure. you go on. Sure. Just, sure. just on behalf of the fire department and things there. We're a class two. ISO is basically stuck on structure fires. But it, it's, it has the thing as far as for fighting fires and stuff like that. So we're, we're, we're up there where we're supposed to be, thanks to the mayor and Mr. Levisky getting us in, the commissioners getting us the equipment that we have. We have remote control hydrant valves that we've, we've, we've been able to purchase the things that we need to, to expedite us getting to the fires and putting the fires out. Of buildings, we actually have of buildings. We actually have buildings of, well, any fire really. But the thing is with the, with, with, with the ISO stuff. I just don't want people to get the nervous or get the wrong idea. We have this thing in there. We have with Pompano, we have automatic aid with Pompano. So when we have that, it comes, we have automatic aid with that. It's limited to structure fires, but they're, they've been incredible partners with us and they, they can, you know, they, if we need them, all we have to do is call them. They come. We have the same phone, which is, is necessary to be compatible with this. There's a lot to it, so, but I just don't want the residents to get the wrong idea that we're not one the ability to, uh, to, to do what we're supposed to do. Now, I guess my biggest concern is the event of that one time it happens. Unlike a structure fire or a garage fire, which can be controlled fairly rapidly in many cases, or at least limit the damage, an explosion of that kind is devastating to, I would imagine, a house, the boat, neighboring properties, that's my biggest concern. And that, I think, is a very realistic issue when we talk about gasoline in an enclosed space as a boat or even the, just a fuel, um, be it the boat or the fuel truck itself, in and around our streets. Absolutely, you know, and that's why that it's not a little fire. It's a big explosion and a big fire. Absolutely, and that's why we try to be as proactive as we can with everything we do, with our inspections, with our buildings that we build. We try to get the sprinkler systems in where we can get them in there. And these, most of the places where these houses, where these boats are and stuff, these aren't little houses that are in there. These are big houses. These big houses catch on fire. You're talking, 
extreme, you know, you're talking a lot of work, you know, and, and, and it, it, it's a lot, you know. And like I said, the, the, the whole thing is that this was like placed back like in 1979. And this thing, there hasn't been anything to change this thing there. So I, I, as, far as, as far as the fire department is concerned, we, we want to, you know, we're, we're trying to err on that side of safety here. You know, we want it. We want it. We want everybody to be as safe as possible. I understand that there's a group of people here that is there, but there's, you know, thirteen thousand people that live in the city, and you know, the mayor and your responsibility is to make do. You know, make sure they're safe. Everybody's safe, and that's my responsibility too. And like I said, all the department heads, we all are in doing the same thing, trying to be proactive, whatever we can do with this to do it, uh, to make sure that. This is a safe place, and this is the place that people want to live. But, uh, you right. sir, but what do you have? What? Mayor, do you have any measures? I just, I, I keep, what, I keep having in front of me a fire chief that's not in love with the notion. I think it's undoubted that you're adding risk, but you know, you're kind of at the top of the pyramid. You're going to be enforcing this. Any thoughts? Anything to add? Uh, to me, it's a safety issue. It was a safety issue when I was on the commission. Um, safety issue when I became mayor. Um, chief Donzel, when he was chief, was dead set against it for all the same reasons Chief Bill Martin is. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, you know, I'm concerned about the safety aspect of it, and that's the only concern I have. Mr. Walker. Yeah, I, since I've sort of brought this up in the first place, I, I understand and respect all the safety concerns, and I certainly appreciate the chief and everything that you've done and the firefighters. And I absolutely respect Kyle and his knowledge. But I think it's a conversation that should continue. I don't think we should just stop it tonight. Uh, I think there are legitimate issues raised by our residents. I think we should keep an open mind. I think that I don't know if there is an appetite on anybody's part to at least continue the conversation and, and see if there is you know, overwhelming evidence or overwhelming concerns that we just want to say no. But my question is, is where do we go from here? Where do we go from here tonight? Do we just end it and say we're concerned about it? Or do we say, let's keep an open mind, let's explore it, let's see if there is value to what the residents have said. They're, they're bringing some legitimate points. And I don't think we can just dismiss it and say, well, you know, we don't care what Deerfield or, or Pompano does because we can control it and they can't. I don't think that's a legitimate reason to stop the conversation. So I'm not suggesting we approve or disapprove anything tonight. Yeah. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that I think it's worthy of keeping a conversation, keeping an open mind and explore it, and see if the chief is really feels that this is just adamantly something we don't want to get involved in in any way, shape, or form. But I just think it's a conversation that is worthy of, of exploring it to whatever degree we can. And I'm not asking for anybody to say yay or nay tonight. I'm just saying that I don't think it should stop here. I think these are legitimate issues that these people have raised and that we owe it to our citizens, you know, to have. And, and Kyle, again, you, you, you're the first person really that I've heard when you're talking about standards and, and judicial issues that could be raised. I think those are legitimate issues that I didn't even know about. So I'm not sure I'm ready to stop the conversation until I'm absolutely convinced there is really no compelling reason to just dismiss it here and be done with it. Okay. I guess my question to you then, Commissioner Walker, is that the ideas and where is the next step? Yep. I mean, because we have, like you said, we have folks that have come out here this evening. Uh, we have the report from the chief. I mean, what is what is your feeling on the next step? Or at least... Well, I wonder if it's... Anybody else up here has that same issue? If it's worthy of, of having some sort of a... Um, limited opportunity to at least explore it on a limited basis or to have the chief work up what he would feel would be regulations that he would feel comfortable with that if anybody were to sell fuel and I think you make a very legitimate point it won't be long and we're going to have fuel delivery for cars what are we going to do then we're just going to say we don't want it or are we going to have to deal with it you know are there regulations we should be looking at that we can control is there something for the chief to explore where there might be on a limited basis a trial uh, or at least drawing up some regulations that he might be comfortable with if we were to allow it on a very limited basis with very you know strict regulations 
on what kind of fuel delivery it would be and where they would go and how they would operate. I just, I'm not sure I'm ready to end the conversation now and just say, okay, well, we can control it, so we're not going to do it. But my, con my concern with that, and I, and I get your point, is I don't, it's a policy question, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a policy question. There, I don't think there is a definitive, there is like a definitive right or wrong answer. The answer of allowing it is right if we allow it to be right and 60 years go by and there's never an incident. The answer is completely 100% wrong if we, if, it, if, we, if we allow it and God forbid something happens. So where I'm sitting at is I am very uncomfortable substituting, like I think even the people here that are advocate for it would at least concede that allowing it in, introduces some additional risk into the city. I, I don't think anybody can deny that, right? I mean, it is allowing something that we have not previously allowed. So that risk might be little, that risk might be great, but it is additional risk and you have to weigh that against valid cost concerns. I don't know what the answer is there, but what I am really, really struggling with is introducing additional risk, and the people that are the, that are the experts that are charged with enforcing it, with the charge informing it, I'm not comfortable. That means it's my wife. Or my daughter. She's voting in favor. She's voting in favor. I don't have a big enough vote. Um, but, I, I'm very hesitant to substitute my judgment for that of the chief, for recommendations from city administration. That's kind of where I am. I am now, quite frankly. I, you know, I, I struggle with it, but I, I, I don't know where we go from here. I don't know. Just like a test program is going to be the way to go. I, I'm not admittedly in love with that notion because you don't have a, a long enough time period to kind of test whether something might happen, that risk is still out there. So those are my thoughts. Anything else? I mean, I just go back to safety concerns from every fire chief I've ever worked with, from John Levisky to Dave Donzella to Chief Gil Martin. Um, just the what if. It, it's it's an increased risk. It's not even a little risk. It's a big risk. And it's kind of like an all or nothing proposition when a, an explosion happens. Um, it's not a couple drips in the canal. It's an explosion in a boat or a property or a, a truck. And, you know, I think we probably would be smart to be proactive when it comes to what's out there in the future as far as fueling of cars, fueling of boats um, on the side of the house and things like that. I mean, that definitely deserves a review. But for the same reasons I'm saying here, it's from a safety point of view. I understand the money point of view, and for the most part, everyone really had big concerns about that. And our job up here is from the health and safety of our residents, and that is my biggest concern. It always has been when this issue has come up, because I have yet to see any new technology um, that would say this is much safer. You know, it's a different type of fuel, um, and, and that's my concern. Yeah, I wish gas was cheaper. Everyone would. But it's the delivery system that is my biggest concern for our safety and welfare of our residents. So I wouldn't wouldn't want to continue the, the trial run, or I wouldn't want to even consider that. One last point, of course. Uh, of course, it's a risk. I mean, there, it, the question is: is it an acceptable risk? Yeah, that's. I, and I answered that. And no. I don't think we've answered that question. I, I, it is a risk. <laughs> But when you look at these other communities and you look at the history, is it an acceptable risk or an unacceptable risk? And I guess what I was asking is, is there a way for the chief or the fire staff or whatever to examine the topic and see if it, if it is an acceptable risk or it's an absolutely unacceptable risk? So what I'm hearing is, is your belief that it's an unacceptable risk. I would argue that we haven't explored the topic enough to make that decision. Else? I just, Mr. when this was introduced uh, a couple of meetings ago, one of the, and we decided to put it on the agenda and talk about it tonight, we were told that there was new technology that uh, had come about since we had passed this ordinance that would make it safer. But I don't think that I heard tonight 
anything I think new. the new technology Something is primarily the boats rather than the delivery systems. The technology is what? The boats and the, the new engines. And we'll, 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 there's going to be time at the end of the meeting, and there can be time at the end of the meeting. We'll just keep order. We can address it at the end of the meeting. Is there anything else? No, I was just under the impression that that was going to be part of the report tonight, that, that uh, meeting with people that were involved in it, and they would tell us. No, 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 no one is aware of no technology that makes no gasoline less explosive. See, I, no one is aware of no technology that makes gasoline less explosive. All right, I Do we want, does the I, I would. I would just say, listen, these folks are here. If we're going to sit here and have this discussion now, uh, I'm just, I want to get it over with. Um, I'm 100%. I know the risk. I've seen the risk. I operate with it every day, more so than anybody else. That's, it's not, it's a risk that I don't believe is worth taking. I don't, for our residents, not only for our boating residents, but for our non boating residents, we're discussing all kinds of other stuff. But if we're going to have a full on discussion with these folks, you're going to be able to basically go back and forth. With us coming back up after we made a decision, I'd rather let them speak specifically more so, I guess, is the field guy that they keep talking about. Is there any objection to that? And just, I, I think there is some sort of, there's some sort of parity in allowing the issue to be addressed from the other side now. We've had a fulsome discussion. If we decide to take action, we can take action. If not, is there any objection to having the person come up now instead of the end of the meeting? Well, the topic is fresh. Somebody, the, Fuel to the fuel guy that's here. Sorry, I couldn't remember your name. Yeah, uh, Darren, was it Darren or Daryl? Sorry, Darren. Sorry, Darren. Is sorry about that. Answer any question you have. Darren. Is there any Darren. objection to that? Darren. I'd limit it though. Okay. Well, we're gonna. We're not gonna. You, you, you can come up, but we're not gonna go all night on it. You can ask me whatever you question wise. Technology the boat. Technology truck wise, there's a ball cut off. Both me specifically, I have. Uh, we have um, the top of the line nozzles that actually cut off. We don't use the pipe system that old people back in the day used to use. It was like a pipe with no stoppage. It was just flowing. We do a sort of a slower speed. The nozzles are extremely expensive, very good. If they don't, if they don't cut off anymore, we replace them. It's not a DOT regulation. You can't keep them in the truck if they don't stop. Uh, there's a ball valve, ball valve next to that, which cuts off the fuel completely from the truck, no matter what's pumping. Uh, then there's another cutoff in case if there's a fire, there's another cutoff at the end of the line, which we use marine grade, highest grade uh, green fuel line. It's very expensive. Uh, there's a, if there's a fire, it cuts off at the hose end. There's a special mechanism that, that locks. And also there's another cutoff. There's three cutoffs for the fuel. So there's one at your point of holding the nozzle, then there's another one by the real then there's another one on the bottom of the truck. Um, just in, just and, you know, we also have a static. The truck is grounded with a clamp, and you clamp the stainless steel, and it's grounded. So at the truck, there's no issue. Um, we've never seen anything with a boat. We've never heard of anything of any sort of a fire while fueling. That's never been. I mean, I've spoke to a million people. Um, we hear of fires with boats that are just sitting there, you know, normal on a day, no, no fuel at all. That's more sort of a common thing, or sinking or whatever. Um, we also keep a lot of pads on the truck, a certain number of X1 thick pads that can soak up anything. Um, we keep also uh, any that's just a solvent, it's like a concrete mixture that collects fuel, you can pour it if there's an area. Uh, obviously, if it's too big, you can't, but we've never actually had any sort of spill of any sort. I've never really heard of too many instances. I've heard of more instances of like propane, things like that. That's why they have to like stop the truck, cough the truck. There's a lot of different things. Propane is more flammable than gas. Um, and and the notion was raised that the safety, the safety issue, the safety improvements in addition to the safety things that are on your truck that you've just explained, yeah. is that, again, respectfully, while I still believe we are inviting big 
Yeah, you're inviting. We are inviting big trucks with a lot of gas into the, the city. To, I mean, let's just. I, I mean, that's just. Uh, that's just basic, the main, right. Basic, okay. But well, I appreciate I mean, you being honest. No, there's a million places that do it. Right. No, I appreciate you being honest. And it's, it's a big truck. Time. It comes in. Um, but but the issue, no, the issue I wanted to get to was though that the safety, the, the that, advancements are in the engines. That the en that I've heard it said that the engines are less likely to go boom. And well, they're separated. Boom. There's a lot of separation. Uh, between the truck and the fuel, there's not a solid like right next to each other. Right. Um, and there's also a, a separate pump in the tank that stops the truck itself. So there's a lot of separation. There's a lot of these special valves now that cut off all the fuel circuit. They don't have that in a regular car. It's a more fuel truck than in the last 10 years. Um, and uh, diesel and gas deliveries, uh, physically and pretty much chemically, they're almost all the same, so to speak. A diesel is actually extremely more corrosive. If you get it on a blacktop street, it will eat up a blacktop street, so to speak, if you don't clean it up. Gas will not cause any damage whatsoever. Um, so just in spill-wise, uh, it's a lot easier to deal with gas than diesel, especially the off-road diesel that we use for the boat. Um, and the price, you guys wanted the price difference. It's normally about a dollar average. Uh, at the dock, or any dock, uh, some places are really crazy, but I've seen it at almost two dollars. So that's usually a dollar average, give or take. Um, just lay it out. If there's any other questions, I'd be happy to answer. Any other questions? You can come up and, yeah, come up and, and We also have, uh, every year, our trucks are specified, and we have stickers on the side of the truck. Uh, they're governed by the DOT, and they're checked for the tanks, certified. We can't purchase fuel unless the trucks are certified. There's no, there's special pressure tests, there's vapor tests. We all have this uh, if you're a legal seller of the, of the fuel. Okay. And it's on the side of the truck. We have a certificate every year. And it's very important that you have that because it's, you know, the truck can't have any sort of a ding or, you know, irregularity or pressure. Everything is very certified. Okay. Any questions for this gentleman? What the pressure is the gasoline pumped at to? Uh, well, we have anywhere from like 18, you could do it from like 15 to 40 gallons per minute. And you can actually regulate it yourself if you'd like. Um, What's that with PSI? PSI, uh, there isn't a PSI because the fuel is uh, sort of pumping with gravity into, into the pump and then you're dictating, it's not really PSI. I mean, th th it wouldn't come I'm out. I'm just trying to think of the pressure on the hose itself. Yeah, it's, it's not. If, any, if it was to spring a leak, I mean, is it uh, no, well, a dribble or cut off off? Well, you have, you have a few cutoff valves, so it, I mean, I don't know, if you, what do you mean, like a leak? Yeah, and, and the other Maybe question, the follow-up to that would be, is there any automatic shutoff if it had a free flow? Um, say something happened and where would it be? burst. Like where would it be? Midway in between both like, and the and Like the if somebody maybe like um, took a knife and cut it or something. What That's yeah, the only but, way it would really Yeah, happen. in between okay. from you uh, and... Not really, you'd have, to, you'd have to shut it off. But um, as I said in my all my years, I've never seen something like that. I've seen mm -hmm. someone, you know, drip a couple drips like you're drinking a soda. Yeah. Um, but I've never seen like any. It, the line is so good, such good quality, and it's always uh, DOT regulated. It, it, it's you, you. You'd have to literally have a razor blade, a, a, like a thick, strong knife to cut it. It's extremely durable, and everything is welded. There's no like man-made like dinky parts. It's very serious quality. There's a lot. The pressure is also. It doesn't constant pressure. It's not like a, a hose at the house. It sort of stops once it gets to a certain point. So if you're not using it, it doesn't pump. Mm -hmm. So it's not like constantly trying to blow up, you know, so to speak. Mm -hmm. it's, it's there with you, and you can do it for an hour and sit there and back and forth, back and forth, slow about, you know. It's not like a crazy thing. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks Mr. Yeah. Mr. Patron, did you want to come up? Uh, everybody's forgetting, in my opinion, one thing, we're voting community. The people that got the biggest beef don't live on the water. I got a problem with that. The technology is in the boats. In 79, when this was put, I ran a boat yard for 20 years. We had fuel, gas, diesel, everything. Uh, the engines were in the uh, bilges of the boats. Any leak, when they fired the motor, it would explode. Uh, now they're all outboards. And uh, that, that's been completely eliminated from the uh, sea. Plus, at home, your boat's cold. At the marina, the boats are all hot. Uh, you, at home, you have a...
professional servicing the boat. Just like she said, a per, uh, an owner, I'm trying to say car. Owner of the boat put water, water in you. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Uh, owners screw up 10 times more. Fires, 90% of boat fires are electrical. So if we don't have the ability to fight electrical fire, we're not a voting community. Uh, I would like to suggest, if we need more money to make this happen, the Waterways Committee has, uh, not at the flea market, given well over, what, in the last eight years, $800,000, $300,000? Where has it gone? It surely hasn't gone for dredging. Uh, let's see. Am I lost here? No, I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank you. It's the favorite part of my night right there, Lou. I'm sorry. All right. It's not. It's not, we'll be, we're going we're gonna to have a public comment on this issue. Come on, Mr. Benz. Yes, come on, Mr. Benz. After. I should say it's Yeah. I know. Can we reopen it? Neil Benz, 3000, or at least 31st Avenue. I wasn't planning to speak on this subject tonight, but I did make a few notes here. First, I would like to say that anybody in this audience who purchased a boat did not purchase the boat knowing they were going to get cheap gas by putting it in their side yard at Lighthouse Point or putting it in their dock. That wasn't why they moved to Lighthouse Point. Lighthouse Point is different from other cities. We don't have to do everything other cities do. We limit what parking people can bring in and put in their front yards and their back yards and their, and their side yards. Now, the technical speaking, I don't know that it was altogether proper for the supplier of this gas to be pleading his own case. But one thing I know, and I think all of you know, when you drag the hose, I don't care what it's made out of, over a fence railing or under a fence railing where there's a sharp piece of the fence, that hose can be cut, and then it leaks under pressure. And nobody knows it's leaking until the spark hits it. Then in reality, you're filling up boats now to take 500 gallons of gas, and every gas tank that you fill up is full of gas fumes before you put that 500 gallons of gas in. And those gas fumes go out the vents. And if there's a spark any place close by, the spark isn't the fire, all respects to Lou. <laughs> the spark is what starts the fire. And then you've got a gasoline fire with gasoline running. Now, why do we require, do we require our gas stations to bury their tanks? Anybody know? So they don't spark? Well, it seems silly that we make them bury, bury their tanks under five feet of earth. But we let this 3,000-gallon tanker drive up and down our streets without any second thought. There's a reason those gas tanks are buried under, underground. Now, would we like to say at the Venetian Isles, this gentleman that has a tank truck, I'm going to sell gas to cars. I'm going to be parking here in the Venetian Isles parking lot. They've given me permission, and I'll give you a 25-cent discount if you come and buy your gas from me. Would we tolerate that? Do we not have any respect for the zoning that we have, for the businessmen that are operating a good business where it's zoned? Are we going to let somebody put them out of business with a more dangerous concept? Well, I have a lot of other notes, but I won't bore you with them. Anybody else? I got to go because I got to get home with the kids. Katie Anton, 2930 um, 39th Street, Northeast 39th. I'm with Jeff. We were from Parkland. I grew up on boats. My dad was a fire chief. Probably knows Sean. We moved here for the Salt Lake. I grew up on boats. My husband grew up on boats. We checked the schools out. We looked over everything. We just bought our boat three weeks ago, and we just found out you guys don't allow gas to be delivered. It doesn't make sense. 
I've, I've never heard of that. And it, talk about the risk. Yes, there's a risk. But Pompano, when's the last time something blew up in Pompano? Lauderdale, Hollywood. Numbers are numbers and facts are facts. It's just not adding up. I don't know. We buy gas now from the marina. Okay, we get it sometimes from Naughty Dog. We get it from the coat, wherever. We're the outsiders coming in. Okay, so I don't know. You know, we're not trying to put anybody out of business. I just don't understand why, number one, yeah, cost is an issue, okay? My biggest issue is convenience, number one, because the time it takes to get out to fuel the boat. I have little kids. But we can't get up and we can't go. The biggest thing is everybody's talking about safety. Lou pegged it. Like, you go to a marina, you're on a hot boat. I mean, it, the safety, we have to, yes, this conversation needs to continue, by the way, Mr. Mocker. But the safety, it's, it, do you know how unsafe it is for these people to drive around in golf carts in our neighborhood? I've never seen such a thing. And we're, that's worse of an issue, okay, in my opinion. So, yes, please, let the conversation continue. But I'm going to get home. Thank you. Uh, Joe Egan, need my address or? No, 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 no. Okay. I don't want to beat it at horse, but I, I think that, you know, and it's an important decision, you know, obviously that you guys have, and you can see that it's emotional out here, you know, for both sides. And, you know, besides the cost, I, I get the, the safety thing. And, you know, I, I think, you know, when you look at when we call our fire department small, well, we are a small town. You know, I mean, when you compare the size of what Pompano has to cover, of course they're going to have more support. But I think if you look at the square footage or you look at the square miles, you know, we should be adequate compared to everybody else. You know, the, the thing that I'm not hearing today on either side is facts. And I think that's the most important thing that we've got to look at is what incidents has happened. I've never heard one. I Googled it. I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find anyone having problems at the house. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, yes, things could happen. But what's the reality of those things that possibly could happen? I mean, no one said that in Fort Lauderdale the truck blew up. I Googled it and couldn't find it. No one said in Pompano that that happened. No one said major gas leaks from the home. Uh, and, and I think, you know, just to assume that something could possibly happen is wrong, you know, for this side and that side. If, you, if there was factual proof that it was putting the neighborhood at danger, maybe I would feel different. But right now, no one's brought that to the table, including, you know, the fire chief, who's done a, a fantastic job here. But again, it's, it, we're listening to people's opinions. I, I think that for you guys to make an intelligent decision, we got to look at the facts. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. And no one on either side has brought the facts to the table. So we all have opinions. Uh, so I, I would, it, obviously you're not going to vote it in today, uh, but let's, let's regroup. Let's take a look at the facts. Let's see what damage could this really do and look at the stats. What cities have had issues? And what issues were those? And was the fire department not able to handle it? Could it handle it? You know, we, there's plenty of people out there that can give us the facts. I would just urge you, everybody on both sides, let's just look at them. But to cut something off like this today, because we're just listening to opinions, I believe would be wrong on both sides. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, I'm not going to cut these. They're going to either say it now or at the end. So I'd rather we already open it up, and I'm not going to close the I'll be brief. <laughs> Father Chappelle, uh, most of you know my address. I live next to the crazy lady with the black olive and the convicted <laughs> felon, 4430 Northeast 26th Avenue, Lighthouse Point. Um, I think I reiterate everything that everybody said tonight, and I'm not going to go through that. But I think the one thing that seems to be the consensus of the group is that we're a community, we're a marine community, and we all want one thing, and that's affordable fuel. We don't want to hurt a business owner. That business owner we all support in other ways, either through food, bait, ice, whatever it is, and they're a big part of our community, and nobody you know, wants to hurt a business owner. But at the same time, we can't have a monopoly, and we can't have people loading their boats with five-gallon tanks like my neighbor and spilling gas in the canal and not being safe. So um, I would ask that you listen to the community. Obviously, everybody here wants to have affordable gas and to be able to have gas delivered to their house. Um, we didn't have one person 
tonight. They, they didn't want to have that. That's from the community. You had staff that recommended that, but if you listen to staff all the time and didn't have your own creative ideas, I don't think anything could happen in the city. So that's what I, I leave with you, and I hope that you guys can bring this back and, and look at it and consider it um, for what the community wants, which is affordable fuel and fuel delivered to the house and, uh, you know, see if there's a way. If we need better fire, if we need to be class one, like you said, I think that's something we should pursue. That concerns me in itself because the worst thing that can happen is have a marina fire. And a marina fire is much worse than any fire we're going to have at a residence. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, no, don't do it. Right. Good evening, Gene Patilli, 4210 Northeast 26th Ave. I'd like to thank the commissioners for listening and hearing us out on this subject. I'm not going to go back and rehash some of the things about how when the fuel is delivered, <coughs> it's delivered by a professional. When you go to the marina, it is done by the boat owner. So when we go to when the guy comes to the boat, he is actually getting on the boat and fueling our boat for us. We are not there with the pump, with the cell phone and the tennis ball in there. There's actually a fuel dispensing technician that is dispensing the fuel into our boats. And again, Chief, great job on, on explaining some of the safety hazards that we do have to be concerned with. Back in 1979, I would probably agree, it might not have been a good idea. But again, with some of the new technologies that the fuel dispensing guy did just to demonstrate that these trucks do have, I urge the commission to please keep this on the docket for next month. Let's get the professionals. When we were concerned about a cava bar coming into the city, we reached out to other cities and found out what they were doing. When there were other issues that we find out that want to come into our city, we reach out to the other cities. Let's reach out to them. Let's do what this last gentleman just said. Let's get some professionals on both sides so we can really hear the facts and not just opinions. Thank you. Thank you. Only once, Leo. Sorry. He does bring a valid point. We come at the end. We got to. We got to. We got to. We got to get through it. We got to get through it. Sorry. Uh, I think Joey did a, did a great job of explaining that we're not doing facts. Everything I've heard here tonight has been subjective. I, you know, with the exception of your class one, that is actually one of the few points that I'm taking on the on the other side. Um, it's not just about cost, it's about convenience, it's about choice, it's about all those things that we live in America for. Um, I think uh, it is, it would be pertinent to, uh, to, to stop and, and do the, you know, see this further. I think both sides need to come up with facts, like Joey says. I, I, don't, I don't agree with the way that it's going on right now. We're just, you know, everybody's just talking about safety, safety, safety. 1979 was way different. Gasoline itself has changed, even the additives in gas. No, it's, it's still the same flammability, but you know, EPA didn't come around until what, 1974? So in 1979, when the commission was here talking about this, you know, there were no signs on the side of trucks. There were none of that stuff. Those valves were there. They just weren't being used on the trucks back then. Totally different environment that we live in now. Um, yeah, so it, it just doesn't make any sense to me why we're not doing this. Choice. That's what, we, that's what the, the people are asking for. They're still going to go to the marina and pay when it's more convenient, but they want the convenience and they want the choice. And I think that's only fair. I think that's what we should have. So I, I hope that you guys decide to go ahead and, and pursue this further and allow the public to come up with some hard facts, some, maybe some boat U.S. statistics that will tell you how often fires happen at marina fuel docks, which is where all, everybody knows that a marina fuel dock is the most dangerous place to be. The only time a fire happens in the back of your house is because of a, a shore power connection. That's what happens. Uh, boats are bonded. There's no, I, I'm not aware of all the stacks that we're talking about. And the hoses can't be cut by a by a, a, a fence or something like that. If it was, you know, then that, that's a whole other story. Those hoses are, you know, an inch thick of, of, of uh, material. So thank you, and I hope to see you again in the next few commission meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Don, you two eight two Northeast Thirty Ninth Court. Um, I will be the second to Mr. Benz's. Uh, against this. Uh, we all keep talking about facts. The facts are sitting right here. Mr. Marshall, that's a fact. That's a fact what happened. I, I, that's a fact, that's a fact what happened. You want to wait and see how else it can happen, how many other different ways. Nobody's going to know that. There's never going to be one person that's going to walk up here and give you guys an exact number that's going to say it will not happen because of this. 
I guarantee you, you're not going to find a person that's going to come up here and guarantee this commission that it will never happen. But this is an example right here that it could potentially happen. And just because we're a boating community, just because we remove, remove fuel from being delivered to a dock does not mean that we're no longer a boating community. We've been a boating community since 1956. We've never had fuel at the docks. And all these people that are boaters have lived in this community for a long time and have considered themselves a boating community. Because if we weren't a boating community, you shouldn't have used that terminology and said, we're a boating community. Well, we've never let fuel go to the docks, so we shouldn't have been called a boating community. So the facts, you got, the, the commission asked the chief to look into it. The chief looked into it and said that he felt, he felt that it wasn't something that he thought was a good idea to bring back in the city. And everybody keeps talking about, we have a new fire station to add more money. I would love to see some of the money that all these people want to add to all this fire station. I would love to see where that's coming from. I would love to see it because all these fundraisers that supposedly we can get to be able to get fuel delivered, what about fundraisers for the parks? What about all this other stuff? Get some of this $300,000 or whatever other money that everybody wants to throw to the fire station. Let's throw it to the fire station. Let's not just throw it to the fire station because you say you can get fuel in your backyard. I'm a resident, I want the fire department to be the top-notch fire department in the whole city. Not just because I can get fuel in the backyard, because I want them to be able to stop a fire at my house. So if everybody's got money and their checkbooks are wide open, I would hope their checkbooks would be wide open whether the commission says we're going to let fuel in the backyard or we're not going to let fuel in the backyard. But if everybody's sitting up here waiting for that one person to come up here and give you a guarantee 100% fact that we're never going to have an explosion, we're wrong. That's not going to happen. So there's not going to be a cut and dry yes or no. But what I can say is what Mr. Marshall said is it's pretty telltale. So do you want to roll the dice? Sure, you could say yeah, and it may never happen. But then, then again, this could happen. And as you all said, do you want to sit up there and say, you know what, we're the ones that said, hey, let's bring in these tankers and let's allow these things to happen. Or do you say, you know what, like Mr. Ben said, when you bought the boat, if you just bought the boat from the lady, I'm sorry, that had the lease, she bought the boat and didn't know about this, but everybody else here, I'm pretty sure knew that they couldn't get fuel delivered, but yet they still purchased the boat. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to close round two of public comment. Commissioners, we've heard a lot of discussion. Is there anything further on this topic that anybody would like to address before we move on? Did I say one more thing? Oh, Chief. No. Sure. No. I can't no. turn no. down. He's not part of the public discussion. Chief, can we, can we, can you, can you address it, can you address it at the end? Take one second. I just want, I just don't want the public to get the wrong opinion you've, of you've, the you've, fire station. You've made the clear. And the fire department. Okay, I just, I, it's. It's, it's a small technicality. I understood. Uh, you've made that clear. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to commissioners. If not, if there's going to be nothing brought up, I'm going to move on to the next item on the agenda. Going once, going twice. Sold. Moving on to department reports, which there are none. No reports to the city attorney. No reports to standing committees. The next meeting of planning and zoning is March 5th, 2019. Code enforcement, February 19th, 2019. Community appearance, March 21st, 2019. Special magistrate, March 6th, 2019. Marine advisory, May 2nd, 2019. We have no unfinished business. We have new no new business. Ordinances, the first item on the agenda. First reading of an ordinance creating section 42391 relating to permitting dogs in outdoor areas of public serve, public food establishments. Uh, Mr. President, members of the City Commission, this is here for your consideration of first reading. This is an ordinance to create a new section 42-391 of the City's Land Development Code uh, regulations, excuse me, regarding allowing um, dogs in outdoor areas of food service establishments. This is separate from service dogs. Service dogs are regulated by federal and state ADA laws where they can go, what they can do, and whatnot. This is basically your companion dogs, your pets. 
Uh, Florida enacted a statute a few years ago, 509233, which provides the authority for local governments to enact an ordinance that would waive certain regulations, like I guess the prohibition on dogs and eating establishments, so long as you met certain minimum requirements for a permit application and certain minimum requirements for regulating that um, allowable use for food service establishments limited to outdoor areas. So this ordinance has been uh, prepared um, consistent with the state statute. Um, it provides, it meets all the requirements for the minimum um, necessary information for applications and regulations. Um, it, um, if you pass it this evening, when you come back uh, for second reading and public hearing, uh, there will be a re resolution uh, along with it that would establish the permit fee. Uh, don't anticipate it to be that significant. Um, just to enable the city to recover some costs for processing the application. This um, um, ordinance did go to Planning and Zoning Board on February 5th, and there was some discussion regarding um, one aspect of it, or whether if someone violates the permit, a 90-day waiting period before they could reapply was too lengthy. That is an item. If you wanted to discuss it, you could. It's not a requirement of the state statute that it have 90 days on that. Um, but I'm here to answer any questions you may have on it. Um, and um, otherwise, it's here for your consideration on first reading. Motion to read? Second. In order to the City Commission of the City of Idaho, point four, amending Chapter 42, Land Development Code, Article 4, Zoning, Division 5, Supplemental Regulations and Requirements for Specific Uses, to create a new Section 42-391 to be entitled Requirements for Dogs Allowed in Public Service Establishment, to provide authority for dogs in certain outdoor portions of public food service establishments pursuant to state law, providing for purpose definitions, application requirements, regulation, permit expiration, and revocation, and complaints and enforcement procedures, providing for complex availability, codification, and an effective date. Commissioner's discussion. I have one. Uh, I'm all for this, but I would like to see that, and, it, and I've talked to Mike about it, I talked to the mayor about it. Um, there's nothing about really defining the dog being under restraint or leash or control of some sort. Yeah. And I, I think it, it's maybe covered in a separate section, but I think for clarity it might be nice if we just include that piece in here, and I'd be more than willing to let Mike handle that in the second reading if we agree with it, but the dog needs to be some sort of under restraint, control of the owner, so it's just not a, a dog park within this designated area. I have a problem with that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense to me. Yeah, it just wasn't in here. But should be in here. Yeah. Um, so I have no, nothing else. Anybody else want to address anything? Subject to Mr. Commissioner Wallace. Nope. Suggesting, can we bring that up? Can we bring that back? Well, I, mean, I guess what would your thoughts be? I mean, yeah, we can include it. Can we include it? Can we pass it now? Yeah. And include it between now and second reading? Yeah, you can You can include it on first. You can pass the ordinance on first reading with direction that we provide some language regarding um, dogs being leashed, restrained, or otherwise under the direct control of the person, the patron. Because, um, you, you know, you don't want to prohibit someone from bringing a guest dog, so you don't want to use the word owner. Yeah. But, um, is that patron. your dog? That's not my no, dog. it's not my dog. No. <laughs> That's out. Does your dog bite? No. No, my dog. Is that your dog? No. Um, my dog does not bite. So anyway, but yeah, if you want to pass it, subject to uh, allow, I, I would suggest maybe adding a sentence to sub paragraph D is in David six, which talks about what dogs can't be on chairs, tables, or other furnishings. Which is that a sentence? Does anybody want to make make Mike? Would you like to make the motion? Then? Well, yeah, I'm just throw it in. Again, he can write it in exactly how it's going to wordsmith it best, but I think that's the right direction. But I think we have a concept there. So are you offering Are you motion? offering the motion? I am offering that motion. I'll second that motion. We have a motion seconded. Good. Uh, pardon me? Good. Yep. Sorry. We second our right. Yeah, we have a motion. We have a second um, to pass ordinance 2019-0971 with um, the provision that the city attorney um, amend is appropriate to address the concerns raised by uh, Commissioner Long. Yep. All right. We have a motion. We have a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Resolutions. Resolution declaring intent to utilize lease purchase financing for the purchase of equipment for fire rescue and public works finance director Apollo. Motion to read first. Second. 
a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Idaho, Point, Florida, establishing its intent to provide for the reimbursement of certain capital expenditures approved in the fiscal year 2018-19 budget with proceeds of future tax exempt financing, providing certain other matters in connection therewith, providing for complex severability and an effective date. Thank you. The 2018-19 the budget included the purchase of um, several pieces of capital equipment, um, two of which were a light pack 15 defibrillation unit for the fire department and a replacement dump truck for public works. Both items were recently approved by the city commission for purchase. And uh, total amount of these two items will not exceed $85,000. They were budgeted to be financed through lease purchase financing, and in order to do that, the banks want to see the city declare its intent to reimburse itself through lease purchase proceeds at a future date. Uh, we have not uh, selected a lender. We haven't gone out to bid yet. That process will take place uh, in the coming months, and so we don't have any information on the actual loan or um, uh, you know, the interest rate or anything like that. Uh, at this time, just recommend the City Commission approve the resolution declaring the intent to reimburse the general fund from the proceeds of future lease purchase financing for the purchase of a life pack 15 and a dump truck. Questions, comments, thoughts, observations? Mm -hmm. Motion to pass. Second. We have a motion. We have a second to pass right. resolution 2019-2249. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. We now have public comments or requests from the floor. Um, the one thing I would ask, um, members of the uh, public can come back, come forward, state your name, if you would like, and pretty please your address. And um, you have three minutes to address the commission. I would ask, since we have kind of been around this mulberry bush a couple of times, that we not repeat ourselves on the topic of field delivery. But um, I will uh, exercise appropriate discretion in that regard. Everett Marshall, 2821 Northeast 44th Street. Thank you very much for the purchase order for the batting cage. Um, I guess I don't have to bring the kids to make sure we get that, so I'll bring you to the guys when it comes time. That we were waiting for that. Um, something that, that came to my attention, I, I try to attend the uh, special magistrate every month when, when he has cases because it's relatively entertaining. It, you should try that sometime on a Wednesday morning. There was a case that came up <clears throat> and, and, it, and it mystifies me because we're always looking obviously for revenue. I mean you, you anticipate so much revenue to be brought in at different things. I'm sure that Frank has it, uh, one of his line items is a uh, anticipated revenue for fines that you're going to create over the course of a year. And that's just a fact. This particular instance was $92,000 worth of fines that was reduced to $10,000. I, I don't get that. There was, a, there was as, as the whole, and, and the solicitor was there, the administrator was there, there was an offer made to this individual for $25,000. The individual didn't want to pay the twenty-five. dollars The lawyer said, I'll pay $2,500. Now, we're talking $92,000. The person bought the property, as I understand it, the person bought the property knowing there was a lien on the property. So the bank is the guy that made out. The poor lady that bought the house is taking the beat, and I understand. I can sympathize with that. Uh, the $25,000 was made. The magistrate had that discussion. The solicitor had that discussion. Went back and, and talked to the administrator. They came back and said, how about 15? And then it became 10. That's $82,000 that the city has lost, potentially. Maybe it should have been half. Maybe it should have been something else. I'm not sure how that works. But, you know, we're talking about trying to find $14,000 for a batting cage for so many kids and fence that we need and, and other improvements to the park. And we let, and I know it's not going to be as simple as the $82,000 just went out the window. The lady went around and she, and she wrote the check for 10000 And it's a duplex. And I think on the record she said her mother was going to, her mother and mother-in-law, was going to live in there, and I went by the house, and it's a duplex. Because it's, 
it was uh, slated on two, two different addresses. So obviously she's going to be make money on one of the houses. So, just a thought. You know, I just, you know, I, I don't, I think that, and it's nothing against the magistrate, because I, you know, I love him dearly, because he really, really puts on a show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, you know, can't, don't, you know, I mean, if the administration says 25000 and and then they come back at ten after the guy, you know, the lawyer wanted 2500 for $92,000. And the lady knew, as I understand it, from what I heard, the lady knew she bought the house with a lien. Understood. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you, Mr. Mark. Wells Fargo made out. That's all made out on that <clears throat> Matt Donahue, 2820 Northeast 39th Court. Thank you all very much for the batting cage. I really appreciate that. As you can see on Monday nights, we have upwards of anywhere between 30 and 20 uh, kids out there for the baseball, and the softball has the same one, so we really appreciate that. I just wanted to say thank you to the Parks and Recreation and to Chuck, your crew, the police department, the fire department. The Keeper's Day was fantastic. I think the greatest event probably was the, the 5K run, and the two people that put that on are probably the best two people in the city. Uh, Maybe just mention their names uh, for brownie points, Matt. Yeah. Yes, uh, it's re being recorded. So okay. Okay. <laughs> um, but no, everything that all the employees in the city is absolutely amazing how quickly they're able to get these things done. The, the parade goes through, all the stuff is out there, you turn around and everything is gone. Uh, the park is a million people, you turn around and it's clean as a whistle. Um, they're there all day long. They're bringing in pizzas on Sunday for the for the uh, park thing that we had on Sunday. It's outstanding how great this city is. And Mike and I were doing the long jump, and as we were in between our, our two sessions, I, we were talking, and this is what makes our city different. Because you don't have this at other cities. Um, you don't have the ability to sit down and, and have three days worth of great things in a city where people actually interact and know each other on a first name basis. And to have employees like this, outstanding. So appreciate everything and uh, again, fantastic job. Thank you guys. Thanks, Matt. Sorry. The, I just wanted to, the uh, one guy got up and said, if you waited around for your staff to come up with any ideas, We'd never get anything done around here. And just so I know you know that we all work very hard every day to make sure we come up with things. So I just wanted to make that point out. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Yeah, I mean, what do you do it here? <laughs> I'm leaving for Hawaii in six hours. <laughs> I'm a little tired. But uh, my name's Maureen Canada. My address is 2521 Northeast 31st Court in Lighthouse Point. I'm a co-owner of Lighthouse Point Marina along with my brother Christian over there. And um, I just wanted to say they, a couple people um, used the word monopoly this evening. And, and you know, We've been running the marina now in our family since 1965, and my brother and I have been running it for 20-some-odd years. And we, being a resident of the city, we've always enjoyed um, other businesses in our community that do well, um, whether it, it was the Yacht Club. Um, you know, we enjoyed when they, they had a viable marine fueling dispensing business there. We didn't ask them to leave. Um, we both were faced with the same regulations, and we chose to um, follow the regulations and put in the new double wall tanks. They chose not to. This isn't something we asked for, um, but we certainly aren't trying to say we have monopoly. I mean, you can go up and down anywhere on the intercoastal. There are many, many fueling facilities up and down the intercoastal. Many. Not that far from us. Um, you know, I go down Atlantic Boulevard. They're right there. There's two. You go down a little bit down on Deerfield Beach. There's another one there. It's not that far. 
So, you know, I, I do take offense to the word monopoly. We do not have monopoly. Um, if the Yacht Club wanted to engage and um, bring in tanks again, we would be supportive of that. Um, we are a small community, and we like to see other businesses succeed. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't it corner and stuff? Sorry, I'm just going to throw that. I put it down. No, more in Canada. I have children. I'll be keeping my name. Thank you. <laughs> Bam. Got For the record. She got me. I got to say. Public comment remains open. Thank you. All right. We'll close public comment. Seeing no one come forward. Communications with commissioners, from commissioners, to commissioners. By way of Carrier Bridge and other manners. Go ahead, Mr. Commissioner Van Buskirk. Uh, I believe. Oh, I'm, no. I think we have ladies a, first. Ladies first. Have a comment. Go ahead. So, ladies started. first. Um, in May of this year, Memorial Day weekend, I'll celebrate my 44th year in my house point. And when I was driving over to the park on Saturday morning at about a quarter to eight to do my part of the 5K run, which was giving out the medals, not running, but everybody had to have a job. But I drove along, and there were all the COPs standing in their little given positions already, and all the barricades were there and everything. And I was like, I, it brought tears to my eyes. I thought, this is just the most wonderful community in the world. I mean, we get things done, and we have such wonderful things, and I was just so incredibly proud of everybody. And, the, and Matt thanked everybody by by name and positions already, but it, it's just an incredible place. It just is. And uh, I envy all you younger people that have your kids growing up here now, because when mine grew up here, there weren't very many kids, and they just have a great advantage. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Go down the line, Commissioner Long. Well, I'll say I can get Sandy beat because in November I'll celebrate 50 years in wow. the City Lighthouse Point. But you're only 45, Mike. I know, I know. It's great how those numbers work, but um, and it is unique in, in many ways. And we're not Deerfield, we're not confident, we're not Boca. But and then I were talking it. The Keeper's Day when Jane McGough and her group kind of came up with that. I don't think she realized what it really means to the community. And from the recreation department to the public works department to the police and the fire, the volunteers, the COPs, um, I know a number of people were here from 5 o'clock in the morning on. And That would be Paul McCormick. That was Paul. And since Paul hadn't gone to bed yet, uh, you know, we brought in retirees and everybody else to work with it. But it was amazing. And as one who I will say participated in the 5K run because I wouldn't call it a run. You know, it was like you the right finish line. You weren't running. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, that was a run, actually. I thought Earl was going to have to pick me up and try to give me the medal. But it, it was an inspiration, you know, to look back of where Lighthouse Point has started from in the last 50 years, and well, longer than that. But from my perspective, from 50 years to where we are today, and, and just what goes on and the fun that it's had and the relationships that are built. And, and with that, I also wanted to move on. The Keeper's Day was fantastic, but I kind of want to do a shout out to, to Matt Donahue and Everett Marshall because, you know, like any good father, we tell our kids to get involved in sports and things like that. And, and Andrew, my oldest, has been, you know, he's done the soccer and football and this and that. And he's, he's right now on baseball. He's in the baseball clinic that Matt and uh, Everett are, are doing and it's just it's a change it's you know he's just so excited about it and there's 25 to 30 kids there every Monday night and just watching them grow and watching the patience that Matt and Everett have with these kids that it's just an amazing metamorphosis that I'm seeing you know with my own son and some of my friends out there are seeing the same thing so I just want to say hats off to you and I did say that we'll double your salary again next year like yeah. you did this year uh, but it's true volunteers and, and I thank you for that because I see it in what's happening so thank you for that okay um, you know I say it a lot of times that in my house point we have a great team and this past weekend exemplified it and it didn't just exemplify it in terms of uh, the employees of the city, it exemplified the residents of the city that came out and supported all these events. We had a huge out, outpouring of support at the Keeper's Dinner. Um, I mean, 
people can move in the room. That's how, how packed it was. And it was, it was really, really wonderful to see. Um, the run went off without a hitch. You know, Sandy hit it on the head. You know, everybody was lined up in their place to do their jobs. And then the people that were participating, they got out there. I think there was one kid that he, he passed my street. You know, he was on the way back before I think the first, the second half of the race came. And he, he, he just flew down the race. Parade was a fabulous event, one of the largest I've seen since I've been in Lighthouse Point. And, uh, you know, go to the kids' uh, sports day on Sunday, great turnout. I mean, the 9- and 10-year-old boys, I mean, there must be 30 of those in that group. And, uh, you know, they, because of that, everything got backed up every time they had to wait for that, for that particular group with such a large group. But just goes to show you, you know, there's a lot of participation and there's a lot of teamwork in the city. And... Uh, all the, every employee um, in the city was out there ready to help and do what needed to be done to get us through. But I'll tell you, the residents that participated, they're part of that team too, and I was so proud to see all that. Here, here. I just, the Keeper's Day was fabulous. I, you know, I echo what everybody said. It is a special place, and that weekend epitomizes it. So um, you just have to keep it going, and uh, I'm sure we'll continue to do great things every year. It was uh, quite a weekend. Yeah, I'll, I'll change the topic. Um, Keeper's Day was fabulous, wonderful. We all loved it and uh, had family in town for it. It was great. What I wanted to do is sort of uh, thank the commission for their indulgence tonight uh, in having this conversation with the community. I think it was important to have it. I don't think many of those folks left here happy with the result, but they cannot say that we didn't listen to them. We gave everybody a chance, multiple chances, to speak. I think it's vitally important when we have an emotional issue like that, whether we agree with it or we don't. We owe it to these residents to take the time, especially now that they're on social media and coming up with all of this crazy stuff about monopolies or in somebody's pocket. We have a responsibility to that community, to those residents, to let them know exactly what we think and how we think and give them whatever time they need to speak. We did that tonight. I appreciated it, and I appreciate everybody's indulgence. Well, I guess I'll leave it off with Keeper's Day. Uh, like Matt, I would like to give out the, uh, I thought the Keeper's Day dinner with Becky and her crew and another special blonde that was able to do a great job of table decorations with her crew with uh, Again, what is, what, it's amazing what they're able to do with like uh, 400 bucks for every table decoration there. So, and another gentleman that didn't get March it was Mr. Vargo. Uh, Dan Vargo helps put together and spearheads the uh, family fun day, which is a complete success. And I think we had like 180, almost 180 kids this year, and that is a lot of kids. If anybody didn't know that, so thanks again, and it was a great, uh, another great Keepers Day, and look forward to the next one. Here you have one other thing. Just one other thing, just a reminder, um, was touched on early in the meeting. Uh, Florida Department of Transportation public hearing on the sample road to count, county line, Palm Beach County line expansion project of the bike lanes and narrowing the medians. That is going to be on February 26th. The advertised times are 5.30 to 7.30, but Scott uh, said today that he was going to start it at 3.30. So uh, I encourage people to get out, learn what they're about to do, and uh, make your opinions known. The good okay. news is, well, the official announcement is 5.30 to 7.30, but he did say today that he would open it up at 3.30, but he's not sure he's able to re-advertise uh, re that at this point. And where is it? Where is it? It is going to be at the Hillsborough Community Center, 50 Hillsborough Technology Drive in Deerfield Beach. Um, it is just east of the uh, Double Tree Inn on the north side of Hillsborough Boulevard, before it, east of 95. Right. Yeah, east of 95. Um, the good news is they started out wanting to get rid of 180 trees, and they're down to 11. So uh, seven of which they said they could save, and seven can be saved. So that means four. So four. That that's good. That's good. <laughs> Considering where we started out. So all right, that's it. Anything else for the good of the order? All right. And we are adjourned. Well done. Well done. <laughs>